Kip McIntyre, 2016 uh, Winston Churchill Fellowship recipient. My uh, fellowship was to go and study the rare craft of coach building and panel beating in America, England, Italy and Germany. I think I'm quite lucky that I, I get to do a job that a lot of people kind of envy. It doesn't seem like a job, like I just, yeah, I swing hammers and at the end of the day hopefully have a cool car made. Mechanical isn't really my thing. I don't like making cars go, but I, I like making them look good. The decision to apply for a fellowship came about because I felt that I'd kind of run out of sort of avenues of places I could go to work to learn what I could from other tradesmen. Going from panel beating and stepping it up that next level to um, like coach building and proper restoration, it is a, it's a very different technique to what I started out learning in just ordinary smash repair. You have to you go back to the older techniques and learn the old ways of the craft and yeah, achieve, achieve the results that they would have used originally on say an old Rolls Royce or Bugatti or anything like that. I think it, was the, it, would, it would definitely be the lack of those craftsmen here in my area that led me to venture out and expand my horizons to other places to get that knowledge and skill. My project was to really travel around the world to see the different ways that everyone kind of achieves essentially the same result, um, restoring classic cars and um, building bodies for cars and learn what I can and come back and create my own sort of way of doing it and using the best of everything. Probably the highlights of my fellowship would have been meeting some really incredible craftsmen. Also realising that you don't just have to be a tradesman in what you do, you can really find like the artisanal craft of every trade really. They all stemmed from something quite incredible to start with and yeah, you don't have to lose that. You don't have to just be a panel beater, you can restore old Rolls Royces or Ferraris, yeah, instead of Toyota Corollas and Mazda 3s and that sort of thing. The, the one thing that really stood out to me was that I, I never realised um, how useful a power hammer would be. I didn't, I didn't realise the quality of a job that they could create, considering we don't have them in Australia, really. It's about two metres tall and about two and a half tonnes, and it's, it's an old cast piece of machinery that has been around since around like the early 1920s. It was used for shaping all sorts of metal, whether it's from automotive panels to aircraft to tin pans and kettles to anything they really needed to make sheet metal out of. My first experience was quite eye-opening to see how good they were. And also getting the chance to actually see some of the most impressive cars in the world. Um, while at car shows and different museums. By going to lots of the different shows like the Pebble Beach Concourse and Goodwood Revival, going to the Peterson Museum, um, it really opens your eyes to realise what sort of cars are actually out there. You go to a car show in Australia and you've got Holden's Fords, like Aussie Classics, um, a few American Muscles, a few old Jaguars and Austins and that sort of thing, but you turn up at one of these old shows and there's just really incredible cars that just come out of the woodwork that you don't really get to see in Australia. My trip started off with a flight to Massachusetts in America where I spent about six days with a man named Ray Shaline, um from Pro Shaper. He actually um, offers like uh, coach building courses to anyone that wants to attend and I thought I'd start off there because he has a pretty unique little concept where he doesn't really just train one school of what he does. He 
He has a power hammer, he has English wheels, he has Italian based um, metal shaping techniques and he really has decided, well, if I'm gonna teach the world how to shape metal, I need to have a crack at every single way and figure out which one's the best. So he's done them all and um, he's come up with what he thinks the best, but he still keeps all the equipment there for anyone that wants to have a go at using whatever they haven't used before. That was a great way to kick off uh, my trip. So from there, I flew to San Francisco and then drove down Highway 1 to get to uh, Monterey, which is where Monterey Car Week is. Monterey Car Week is probably the biggest car show you'll ever find in the world. It's, it's where the best of the best uh, classic cars uh, put on, on show and they have the biggest concourse in the world, which is the Pebble Beach Concourse. Cars there can be in excess of $40 million, $50 million for a car and yeah, they get judged on how well preserved or how well restored they are. And the year I went was the year for the Isota Freshini. Any car that generally gets asked to attend at Pebble Beach is, it generally has a story that goes along with the car. It's not just a, oh, this is a nice Ferrari. It's, it's a, this Ferrari was owned by so-and-so and raced in this historic race. And you can actually trace that specific car's history to the day it left the workshop. Every car has its very own special little story. So, um, so having the opportunity to see some of those cars, talk to the owners of those cars, the guys restoring them, um, yeah, it was re really eye-opening. We just don't have anything quite to a standard like that in Australia. Yeah, while I was at Pebble Beach, I was lucky enough to attend different forums with guest speakers such as um, the classic car designers of the 60s, hearing their take of what goes into designing these cars. I heard from people like Wayne Carini, um, who's well known in the classic car world, um, Jerry Seinfeld, Jay Leno all spoke about their um, experiences with classic cars and also uh, Jackie X, a Formula One driver. Um, but yeah, so hearing everyone's different takes on the industry, the cars and their experiences, that was a really special moment for me, getting to sit there and listen to all of them talk. So after Pebble Beach, I kept driving down the coast to uh, Los Angeles, where I spent about a week uh, working alongside uh, Steve Hogue from uh, Steve Hogue Enterprises. Uh, he's a little one-man shop. He's well known for uh, his work with Porsche 356s. He knows them like the back of his hand. He's continually always doing 356s. Um, along with a few other things, but because he has that repetition, you start to get quite efficient at um, that style of work, um, rather than if you were trying to do one Bugatti and then a Mercedes and then a Ferrari, like it's learning on every job. He was definitely the quickest worker that I've, that I've spent um, time with. He was able to pretty much put a whole tail end of a 356 together in a day, which would normally take quite a while. From there, I did uh, day trips um, where I went and uh, went and met um, Rod Emery, who is um, he's no known for doing uh, Porsche 356 Outlaws or Hot Rods, um, something that's not normally done in classic car sort of world. In that sort of area, is yeah, chopping them up and doing all sorts of modifications to them, but. It's what his reputation is known for and he's known worldwide for it and um, has a big demand for his work. He was interesting to see because he implements a lot of new technology in uh, car restoration, 3D printing, 3D scanning and that sort of thing, which is definitely has a lot of advantage nowadays in, in a craft like this. In days gone by, you used to have to make a buck, which is kind of like the form that you would make your panel to. You would make that 
out of timber and sh make it by hand and you would scale it up from drawings or photos of a car, um, which is incredibly time consuming. You can spend a thousand hours before you pick up a piece of metal to make a panel. Whereas nowadays, if you've got anywhere from even just like a one tenth scale model of a car, you can get really accurate 3D scanning of that scale it up on the computer, send that to a CNC company and they'll cut out all the forms for you and you just put them together like a jigsaw puzzle and start making essentially. So he would uh, draw up a door handle design or a wheel design and um, with 3D modelling software and then he'd hit the print button which would go to his 3D printer and he'd print out a, a whole wheel and he would He'd have that wheel made out of plastic and he would go and bolt it onto the car and he'd stand back and look at it and go, yeah, I like that, I don't like that. I can just tweak something, print it out again. And um, so all these tooling costs and that sort of thing are very cheap to, to do a prototype of something before you then go and make it for good. Because it's an, it's an expensive uh, craft to start with. It's expensive to restore these cars. So, Anywhere to make it more streamlined and efficient is definitely gonna help, whether it's just making it cheaper for people or actually making a restoration attainable for someone. After that, I went over and met Jay Leno at his uh, place. I pulled into the driveway and there's Jay Leno and turned out Magnus Walker, who is a famous Porsche ambassador at the moment. And all of a sudden, I'd, there was two idols in one. He and I walking around, checking out just some of the most incredible cars you've ever seen, um, from steam-powered fire engines to Lamborghini Murras to electric-powered things to every, everything you could think of, and then motorbikes and jet-powered cars and that sort of thing. It was really incredible collection. Talking to him about he, where he kind of sees the classic car industry going, um, he has an interesting sort of take on it about cars these days, uh, he seems that he, he believes that they'll almost be unrestorable when it comes time to restore something. When, when cars have lasers and computers and cameras looking out and all these computer modules and there's just so many people um, that would be involved to try and restore one of those cars when all that sort of stuff starts to break down. Um, yeah, they get, just to go in and do a general service on a new Ferrari is uh, you need a tool that costs $25,000 just to plug in and talk to the computers. So to restore a car like that when it's been run down will be very interesting. So um, yeah, that's, that's definitely worth thinking about for the future of car restoration. And yeah, I, I think I ended up st spending about six hours in Jay Leno's collection, walking around and helping out. And I thought I'd kind of got to the I'd overstayed my welcome and I was walking over towards Jay Leno to, to say, oh, thank you for having me and I appreciate it. And um, before I could get that out, he said, oh, are you hungry? I said, sure, sure, why not? He goes, let's go get lunch, eh? And he goes, you guys have a thing called a Hungry Jack or something? I said, yeah. He goes, I think that's what we call Burger King. He goes, have you had that? I said, no. So he goes, Right, oh, let's go to Burger King. I'll show you what Burger King is. I said, right, on. So we jumped in his brand new Tesla. He was he was quite impressed by this brand new Tesla that he'd got. Um, yeah, so we we jumped in the car and we went, did drive through at Burger King with Jay Leno, which was one of those moments you're sitting in the car and ordering a meal and you just go, how have I ended up here from swinging hammers in Brisbane to cruising around Hollywood with Jay Leno? There's definitely a a wow moment. Um, but yeah, so after that, we did a little bit more work on his Duesenberg and I thanked him profusely for everything he did. And um, yeah, I went back on my way and did a few more days with Steve Hogue. I also went and visited the um, Peterson Museum. Just the range of cars they have is really incredible. The main thing I wanted to see at the Peterson Museum was actually a car that was called the Bugatti Type 64. It was a car that was never built. As coach building works, you would you would have a set of chassis made and Gene Bugatti got uh, two bodies made that he designed. So he would design the first body, got that made, designed the second body, got that made, but then he was, he was unfortunate to pass away before 
he got to make the third body. Um, so that chassis sat for decades on end with nothing happening with it, just sitting in storage until about 2012, I believe. Um, a man got hold of that and he decided that it needed a body made for it. So what would Bugatti have designed? What was the next step? So we know what was up until that mark and we know what followed on from that car. And um, he goes, what would that little middle car have looked like? And um, so they came up with a design and um, they got Mike Cleaves from um, Automobile Metal Shaping in Detroit to commission and build that body for that car. So they actually then proceeded to make the body. Um, and yeah, that was a car that I fell in love with, the story of it and the way it looked and the way it was made. After leaving the Peterson Museum, I, I flew over to Detroit to actually work with Mike Cleaves from Automobile Metal Shaping that built that Bugatti. I spent a week and a half with him and his team and I think that was probably the, the, the best time of my entire trip. Um, they have an astounding understanding of the craft. They, their passion is like nothing I've ever seen before. They, they not only just like to make the panels, they have an entire woodworking shop set up for making the ash wood frames. And then they decided they needed uh, to make different brackets that were forged and that sort of thing. So they created a forging room and that sort of thing. Every bit of equipment that any factory generally used to metal shape cars, they went and they sourced it and they got all the original equipment and set up the most incredible workshop you'll ever see. To match their workshop, they have they have a library that would probably be almost the size of the workshop that I'm in now. One of the most exciting things about working with them would have been seeing the Pettengill Power Hammer. Um, the Pettengill Power Hammer was designed in the early 1900s. It's a beautiful old cast machine that um, they, they managed to have about, I think they've got six power hammers at the workshop, um, ranging from the earliest one they own is from about 1925, I believe. Hans Sorling um, is actually one of the guys that works there and I spent a lot of time working alongside him, learning from him and um, in his spare time, he actually has decided to put the Pettengill Power Hammer back in a manufacturer. Um, he hasn't tried to update it and make it cheaper or any different or, yeah, he has, he has cast the original, made the original patterns and cast exactly to the way that they were still used as a leather clutch and, yeah, everything about it is as it was in the 20s. Um, yeah, so it was incredible seeing that history and then it being brought back to life for uh, the rest of the world to essentially get their hands on this lost equipment um, to continue to make some incredible um, parts off it. Once I was finished up at Detroit, um, that, was, that marked the end of my time in America and it was time to move to the UK. When I got to the UK, I uh, worked uh, with the guys at Southam Metalcraft. While I was there, I uh, helped out with making a timber buck uh, for uh, about a 1926 Riley 9 prototype. But the interesting about, thing about that car was that it was, we believe that it might not actually ever have existed. There was only three photos that we could ever find of it. Yeah, we think the, the photos were all just a simple mock-up out the front of the Riley factory and um, just wheels leaning up against a body, not sitting on the chassis properly. And I think it was just kind of a way for them to say, oh, we've made this incredible car, but then not actually then have to follow through with it. Um, and you can kind of see in the photos that the, the guys sitting in the car have a smirk on their face. And we've decided it's because they know that it's all a hoax. Yeah, from there I was lucky enough to then go and spend about a, it was probably a bit over a week I spent um, at the uh, Aston Martin factory. I did a tour of their new Aston Martin facility and then I then proceeded to go back to the original factory that all the early hand-built 
Aston's were built in in Newport Pagnell. It's, and that's where, if you have an old Aston, um, it's kind of like a coming home where it's, it goes back to that same facility that it was originally hand built in, gets restored and rolls back out the exact same doors that it would have first come out of. You, you definitely feel like you're a part of history there. Because they are doing repetitive work of Aston Martin DB5s or DB3s, they can afford to spend a lot of money on tooling. So the bucks that they had were, they, they were CNC'd out of solid nylon in the front end. So instead of having just station bucks, you could, it was an exact sculpture in all nylon that you can work to, which is, yeah, almost priceless when you're making a panel, but kind of unattainable for someone that's making a one-off car. But so being lucky enough to work on a bit of tooling like that was incredible. So from there, I then went to uh, Roach Manufacturing. Their quality is really impressive. They, the finish on their work just comes up like an absolute mirror. Um, their attention to detail and their recreation work is really impressive and it's w known worldwide. I made some um, uh, fenders for a little Austin while I was there with them. <laughs> Uh, I've visited quite a few car shows and that sort of thing while I was there, which was great to see the way that they put on shows and they kind of get a lot of the public involved and that sort of thing. So from there, I then went to Italy. I went and visited Ferrari, uh, Lamborghini, Ducati and also uh, some of the best Italian coach builders like Brandoli and uh, Cremonini and, um, and Maranel Classics and that sort of thing. And I knew before I went that they would be very secretive about their work, as I'd heard from everyone when I said, I'm going to Italy to see what I can learn. They said, you won't learn anything there. No one will tell you anything. They won't even talk to you. Um, in a way, it was true. They were all excited to meet me. Um, they all spent an hour or two showing me around their workshop, but none of them were willing to teach me anything. Um, it wasn't the biggest shame to miss out on working with them, but it was great to see the style of work they do, see the equipment they use and that sort of thing and how they use it. The plan was to spend about three weeks in Italy, but after a week of kind of not getting the chance to work anywhere. I was sitting at lunch and I decided, actually called a guy, um, Torsten Walsdorf in um, Germany, and I said, is there any chance I could come and visit you? And he said, sure, come whenever you want. The door's open. The, the interesting thing about um, Torsten, he actually bought a company called Simonson 356. Which is they, they actually make reproduction panels for Porsche 356s. It was interesting seeing a company that does that as well as restoration. A lot of reproduction panels I've always tried to steer clear of and just make the panel from scratch by myself. Just because the, the standard of panel um, manufacture generally hasn't quite been up to scratch on the quality of builds that I've been working on. Torsten's motto in anything he makes is to make an exact part that the factory would have made um, and not kind of um, drop the quality anywhere just so he can get his reproduction panels out. While I was there, he was um, doing some final touches on a um, Porsche 35, an early 356 floor pan. And uh, there's other companies that make them, but um, he said there's, Throughout the uh, period that those floor pans were made, they went through a few different styles and he said he actually tooled up so he can make every single different style, whether it was just a slight indent in the center or in two years later, it was meant to be two inches to the left. Um, he tooled up to make every floor pan so it is exactly the way that they came out of the factory. So. After I'd spent that time with Torsten, I Jumped back in the car because I had to fly back out of Italy, so I had a few days to make it from Germany back to Italy, and, and they said, oh, you could go up over the Swiss Alps, so I could take that route, or apparently the new tunnel cut's about four hours off the trip, but I decided it was 
Only one chance you get to drive the Swiss Alps. I followed along behind a, a new Ferrari that was cruising around the Swiss Alps and um, I was in a little Fiat 500 that I'd, that I'd hired and um, yeah, I think I followed that Ferrari, chased him around the Swiss Alps pro probably about three hours. And um, once he pulled away to this, he pulled off, I uh, checked my GPS and I realised that pretty much at the start of following him, I'd gone the opposite direction to where I needed to go. So I went three hours out of my way chasing a Ferrari and I guess I had another three hours to go through the Swiss Alps again by myself, back the way I was meant to go. But that was a, that was a great experience to, to do that while I was there and had the opportunity. I went over with uh, a certain set of goals of things I wanted to achieve from undertaking the fellowship and things I wanted to learn and um, I found that I came back with much more than I was expecting. I, I, I formed relationships that I will uh, cherish for the rest of my life that not only opened up just for that fellowship but any more questions that I ever come up with I can approach them and continue on with the fellowship. The initial fellowship I guess lasted for eight to ten weeks but that's just the bit when you're overseas it's it's a bit that it actually does in the background that you, you now have an understanding of anything's achievable now because of the fellowship. It's probably taken the fear away or, or, or it's let me know that everyone out there just wants to do the same thing as me really. Like we all want to be craftsmen and we all want to learn as much as we can. And um, yeah, I think, I think that's probably a, a little bit of a model that I see for my future. Um, continuing for, forever learning is probably one of my hobbies as well as making cool cars. I think one thing that I would share for the audience watching this, whether you're a um, coach builder or car story yourself, I would definitely encourage you to seek out Anyone that inspires you, whether it's on Facebook, just from reading articles or on Instagram or whichever media you're getting your inspiration from, get in contact with the people doing that work. They're not some, someone up on a pedestal that you can't talk to and you can't ask questions. They, we're all essentially the same, no matter where you live. Um, everyone wants to make incredible things and everyone has a mutual respect for other people making incredible things. No matter what trade you're in, try and try and find that artisanal craft, whether it's from restoring old roof roofs on um, on historic buildings and that sort of thing. You don't you don't just need to build kit homes these days that are going up in all these little estates. You can you can find that original craft it once was and yeah, go down that path and find the enjoyment I think that any trade can really give you. That was a very important thing that I learned from my trip was I went to so many shows and it wasn't just for the people wanting to drive their cars, it was people that wanted to watch the cars. It was an event for families to come along to and experience, like a, a snapshot of history almost and let them know that these things exist. There are people out there restoring them, using them and wanting to share them with the world. I think the Australian government kind of needs to look at some of the legislation um, around the special interest vehicles scheme, um, kind of making it probably a bit easier for classic car owners to get their car on the street, to drive them to go get coffee on a Sunday morning or to join club runs and just use them more, get them seen by more people and enjoy. If they get to the point where they're so expensive and to maintain and run and yeah, then it makes it hard to get them on the road. I think it, the public loses out and then in generations to, to come, we just won't have people interested in classic cars because they never grew up knowing they were there. They were in someone's basement. There's nothing better than when you're six years old and you see some wooden, wooden wheeled car driving down the road with four people in it going for a picnic somewhere in a T-model Ford. Like, that's stuff that you'll remember for the rest of your life.
I've come back now and I've taken on some school work experience kids that have come and spent some time that have shown interest in maybe this is a career path that they'd like. Spend some time with them. I have an apprentice at the moment who's looking to uh, really make something out of the trade as well for himself. I've given a bit of a brief talk at TEDx in Brisbane. Um, but yeah, I also have been uh, talking with um, our apprenticeship organisation here in Queensland about finding ways that I'd be able to get involved and um, maybe open the eyes of all the kids doing these apprenticeships that would generally lead them on a path towards everyday smash repair and kind of opening their eyes to realise that there's a craft behind panel beating. My Churchill Fellowship definitely hasn't stopped yet. It's, it's only opened bigger doors and created more goals and more questions for me to, to figure out. And um, yeah, and it's given me that understanding that you don't have to wait to get an opportunity like this to go and achieve those things. It's a matter of jumping on the phone, calling the people, jumping on a plane, flights are cheap enough. You go and visit these people there. They'll open the doors and yeah, it's, it's definitely, the, the information's out there to get and it's just a matter of believing in yourself and going and getting it. Find out how you can travel the world to benefit Australia at churchillfellowships.com.au.